before I joined the military, I hated the water. So I had to go practice. So every morning I wake up, I go to the pool. Before I jumped in that water, I put my toe in the water to feel how cold it was. Me doing that was my silent protest. It was me feeling sorry for myself. It was me being a little bitch. And I realized if you're gonna do something, anything in life, you better attack it. A lot of us are going through wanting to be better, wanting to find more. And what we're doing is we're putting our toe in the water of life to see how cold it is. We're not attacking anything. We're going at it half-assed. There's one thing for sure. A lot of us think we can rise to the occasion. When you can't, you fall back on your training. And if your training sucks, so will you. Stay hard. Hi everyone, Mike here from Bikes by Mike with another cycling related video. This is the second of five episodes I'll be doing on the Oat Root Pyrenees five day cycling sport teeth. My last episode was on course design and race format. This episode will be about my Oat Root training plan and suggestions on how you might want to approach the development of your own training plan for Oat Root or for another goal event. Episode three will be on nutrition, supplements, and fueling. Episode four on bike maintenance and setup. Episode five on race and post-race wrap up. And that's it. So, okay, let's get to it. Disclaimer, I'm not a coach, trainer, physician, sports scientist. I don't know you and I don't know what's best for you. After years of trial and error mostly, I know what works for me but that may not be what is right for you or safe for you. Okay, now that's out of the way. Like everything in life, you learn by taking in the information, advice, experience from others that is helpful and ignoring that which is not. When it comes to training and performance advice, there is so much out there and a lot of it is conflicting advice. So how do you sort through the BS to get to the good stuff? Well, for me, I listen to the advice that comes from two categories of people. The first are sports performance scientists with both clinical and research experience. These are areas of biomechanics, physiology, psychology. And the second type are successful athletes, people that would not have achieved their level of success at the highest level if they were training wrong. I do not listen a whole lot to coaches or trainers. Not because they're all bad, they aren't. It's just because it's much more difficult to separate those that know what they're talking about from those that do not. Classifying oneself as a coach or trainer does not mean one is qualified to give good advice. And because as a whole, their approach to training, regimented, specific, often overly complicated, is an approach that just doesn't work for me. 12 years ago, I did follow a very regimented training program by a pretty famous, at the time, respected coach. I followed it for one full season. And in that season, I had more injuries than ever before. I performed worse than previous years. And for the first time, I didn't enjoy my cycling at all. Worst of all, the training program was 100% based on cycling. There was no weight training, stretching, yoga, or other sports thrown into the mix. And that caused me to develop muscle imbalances on one side of my body. And during that year, I pulled my back out really badly and I was diagnosed with a bulging disc. I was in complete agony for about eight weeks and I took six months to fully recover. I spent most of my time like this. And without the opportunity to exercise, I spent a lot of time reading about the causes of back injuries and ways to prevent it. And this was the book that put me on a different path. It was eye-opening and life-changing. I realized that a lot of what I was doing up until then, or not doing, was completely wrong. After the injury, I made major changes to how I trained and just how I lived my life. That has led me partly to the approach I have here. But before I talk about my approach to training, let me tell you what this video is not. It is not a training manual. I do not have 
I do not create, I do not use anything that resembles a training calendar. You know, stuff that looks like this or this or this. I won't spend any time talking about the seven Kogan training zones, you know, those overly complicated training intensity zones. I just finished reading the book by Phil Cavell called The Midlife Cyclist. A great read for any level of rider and despite the title of the book the concepts apply to cyclists of all ages men and women not just old dudes like me he makes the point that the sports industry is guilty of meticulously dissecting training levels and training data to what he terms unhelpful incomprehension terms like threshold subthreshold super threshold recovery aerobic lactate threshold super aerobic levels and a whole bunch of other terms and it goes on and on and he rhetorically asks whether any of this has actually made athletes faster hmm what i've noticed is that the real science-based leaders and experts in the field of endurance sport today are now taking a much less complicated approach to training they typically talk about two or at most three not seven training zones those being low intensity, medium intensity, and hard intensity. Some even omit medium intensity and rely only on two zones of low and high. The reason being that these are the only two or three training zones that are relevant because they're the only ones that are associated with distinct physiological changes in the body. Here we're talking about meaningful changes in blood lactate levels and respiration. So low intensity, aerobic, or think of less than 80% of your maximum heart rate. This is where your energy source is fully sustained based on a combination of glucose and fatty acid, which is made into ATP in the mitochondria. You can sustain this forever. You're functioning essentially in an oxidative state where the supply of oxygen to the body is sufficient to support the effort. And then we have high intensity, think anaerobic, or greater than 87% of your maximum heart rate. This is where your muscles do not have enough oxygen to create the energy you're demanding. So instead of producing CO2 and water, they also produce excess amounts of lactate. Your body is unable to clean up the extra hydrogen ion created by lactate, which causes the burning feeling in your muscles. I'll touch a lot more on this hydrogen ion in the future episode on supplements. Niels Vanderpool was gold medalist in the 5,000 and 10,000 speed skating events at last year's Winter Olympics. He describes his approach to succeeding in speed skating as a puzzle with only two pieces. The first is competition speed capacity, and the second is aerobic capacity. So his training is either directed at improving anaerobic shorter efforts or longer aerobic efforts. Nothing more, nothing less. The high intensity and low intensity zones I just spoke about perfectly target the two and only two components of sport Neil spoke about. Okay, enough about what this video is not. This is what it is. It's a set of simplified training concepts with each having an associated training protocol. Together, these can be used as guiding principles on how to train effectively. It'll allow you to lay out a rough plan for yourself without having to do anything that looks like this. My first training concept is that human beings are adaptable organisms. Giving another quick nod to Niels, he said, quote, my job as an athlete was simple. Give the body as much stimulus as possible and then recover. This broad principle of training can be reduced to nothing more than this. Human beings are adaptable organisms. And the training concept that is built on this is termed progressive overload. The process by which you apply a training stress or stimulus, think of a workout, that induces fatigue and causes the body to trigger an alarm bell and to go into recovery phase. If this is done correctly, it causes what is called supercompensation, where you come back better and stronger. Through this process of supercompensation, as workouts go on from session to session, you need a more significant stimulus to disrupt the new level of equilibrium. That means that the same workout that worked before will no longer provide enough stress on the body to bring further adaptations and improvements. Adaptation comes with stress. 
If you want to continually improve, you must have a method of applying overload. You won't get better by doing the same thing month over month or year over year. When athletes talk about reaching a plateau, what they really mean is that they can no longer hit this supercompensation phase. There are two quotes that are all too relevant here. This one, and this one. So the protocol associated with training concept number one is keep training levels high, either in volume and or intensity. So this is a heavily loaded comment. Saying that you need to keep training levels high is generalizing just a bit too much. Here we need to spend some time talking about the concept of periodization, which is used as the basis for almost all endurance training regimes. Periodization training programs come in many shapes and sizes, but they share three distinct cycles, macro, meso, and micro. The macro cycle is the 30,000 foot view of training. It's your training over the course of a season or a year. For a competitive athlete, it begins with the start of training and ends with a goal event. Within the macro cycle are three progressive phases of base, builds, and what is called specialty, or often referred to as peak. You start off mainly with training volume and just a bit of intensity. And as you move to build, you keep volume high, but also add intensity. And as you move towards your peak, you drop both intensity and volume to ensure you don't show up for your event completely burnt out. It's no more complicated than that. And in my opinion, you don't have to be overly strict on how you lay out your training within this periodization plan. Just generally follow this progression and you'll have better results than most others. The reality is that whether they know it or not, or whether they plan for it or not, all super fit elite athletes follow some form of periodization training plan. The best example of this is the great icon in mountain biking, Ned Overend. Mountain biking world champion in 1990, six-time national mountain bike champion, two-time Xterra world champion. Ned is well known for having spent his entire career without using any type of structured or deliberate training plan. He rarely, if ever, used any training aids like a heart rate monitor or power meter. It's only in high sight when he looked back on his career that he came to the realization that even though he didn't plan it, his seasonal training looked very much like a periodization training program. Maybe not as textbook as some other athletes, but it resembled it nonetheless. By the way, if you're watching this and don't know who Ned Overend is, you should. There's no excuse. Even if you're a young pup, there's simply no excuse. Look him up. The second training concept is a strong aerobic base will make you go longer and harder. Cycling is an endurance sport. The key to developing endurance is being able to recruit mostly type 1 muscle fibers to do most of the work. Going back to our earlier discussion on the differences between low and high intensity training, aerobic effort utilizes type 1 slow twitch muscle fibers which can go much, much longer than fast twitch muscle fibers. So making your aerobic system more efficient allows you to go longer and harder. The protocol for training concept number two is train at various intensities with the most time spent in zone two. Tadi Pogaccia, arguably the most informed pro cyclist at the moment, spends about 70% of his off season in zone two. That's a lot at low intensity. So what is zone two? It's the level of intensity you can hold almost indefinitely. You can carry on a conversation easily. If you're struggling to talk, your intensity is too high. If people can't tell from the sound of your voice that you're working out, your intensity is too low. You're probably then in a zone one. How much time do you spend in zone two? As much as possible before you die of boredom. But seriously, probably a minimum of 1.5 hours per session and two to four sessions per week is a good place to start. The third training concept is omitting cross training will hurt performance. Only doing one type of exercise, say cycling, will lead to muscle imbalances, muscle weakness, and a higher risk of injury. Cyclists need to cross train somehow. And for those that think adding weight training to your endurance training routine will sacrifice cardiovascular fitness, the science says that this is not the case. 
If you are an endurance athlete and you add strength training, it will almost always not compromise endurance gains. Train what is weak. If the limiting factor in holding race pace is muscle fatigue, not cardiovascular strength, then spend more time training muscular endurance. Two people may well have the exact same VO2 max, but have two different reasons for reaching their limit. For one, it might be the cardio that causes them to pull the plug. For the other, it might be their legs that simply give out. The one that improves what they are weak at is the one that will surpass the other. The protocol for concept number three is train what is weak. Yes, you get good at what you train, but there's such a thing as too much of a good thing. Build variety in your workouts to build both the depth and breadth of fitness. It will make you stronger, healthier, and more motivated to train. The fourth training concept is resilience is only developed through lots and lots of practice. Eddie Merckx once said, quote, cyclists live with pain. If you can't handle it, you will win nothing. The race is won by the rider who can suffer the most, end quote. It's so true. Another quote I love is by Dr. Simon Marshall in his book, The Brave Athlete, Calm the Fuck Down. He says, quote, when it comes to exercise habits, we estimate that about 10% of all quits are legit quits. But it's also impossible to know, given the human brain's tendency to bullshit when asked to explain itself, end quote. Athletes tend to have a higher tolerance for pain, not because they inherently handle pain better, but because they train for it. They practice by regularly putting themselves in uncomfortable situations. The protocol for training concept number four is use coping strategies to deal with pain and suffering. How do you do this? I won't get into it too much here, but there are many ways to do this. Here are two of them. First, experience it a lot. Train for it. Second, don't ever let your chimp know that quitting is an option as it may well take it. I was listening to a Huberman Lab podcast, which talked about the neurological processes in play when we experience pain and suffering. What I found really interesting is that it takes a lot of energy for your mind and body to contemplate quitting. This mental energy is actually at the expense of physical output, wild. So conserve that energy by telling your chimp that quitting is not an option, it's off the table. Tell yourself, it's not whether I complete the race or not, it's all about how I will make it to the finish line the fastest. Tell yourself, the sooner I get this done, the quicker the pain and suffering will end. The fifth training concept is body fat adds nothing to performance. Yeah, I know, almost too obvious to mention, but it's important, so I have to mention it. Maximum oxygen uptake, or what is called VO2 max, tells you how fast you can deliver oxygen for use by your muscles. It is the most important predictor of performance in endurance sports. There is almost a perfect linear relationship between VO2 max and lean mass. The more body fat you have, the lower your VO2 max and vice versa. Actually, fat mass is a better predictor of VO2 max than exercise performance. There is a reason why power to weight ratios, not absolute power, or FTP, but power to weight, is so often referenced when judging one's ability to perform. It translates very well to speed on the bike, particularly when climbing uphill. The protocol to training concept number five is reduce body fat. Obviously, doing what we're talking about here, training, is one of the best ways to reduce fat. But there are many other ways as well. Finding out what works for you is important. As you're suffering, working out, get comfort in knowing that the science says this. VO2 max is highly correlated with longevity. Mitochondria function is highly correlated to longevity. And nothing prolongs longevity more than exercise. Are, are you motivated to train now? The sixth training concept is performance gains are made during recovery, not training. To optimize training and therefore performance, we want to apply the maximum training stress that leads to positive adaptation. Too little stress and your fitness will plateau or decline. Too much stress and your body will not be able to sufficiently recover to come out the other side stronger. And too much stress too often and it will lead to overreaching or worse yet, overtraining syndrome. 
OTS has long-term negative health impacts and is very, very serious. It is impossible for you to know how much you should train, either based on volume or intensity or both, without monitoring your recovery. If you do not have an objective and accurate way to measure recovery, you most certainly are either training too much or too little. And in both cases, you're moving backwards, not forwards. The protocol for training concept number six is monitor your recovery daily and adjust your training accordingly. There are more than 125 signs of overreaching and overtraining. So knowing what to measure or what to look for isn't all that easy. So it's best to take just a few metrics and stick with those. There are subjective signs like persistently heavy or sore muscles, constant fatigue, mental burnout, depression, frequent illness. All those are signs of overreaching or OTS. There's also objective measures. I'll suggest three good ones, but feel free to mix and match. But these three have the science behind them to say that they are accurate predictors of the state of your recovery. One, HRV. Two, resting heart rate. Three, sleep quality. First, heart rate. If it's lower than normal during training, it means you're tired. If it's higher than normal during training, it means you are in good shape or you are sick. Yeah, it could be either good or bad. If it's higher than normal during rest, it means high stress and or sickness. If it's lower than normal during rest, it means you are in good shape. How quickly your heart rate recovers after hard efforts is an excellent and easy way to judge your state of recovery and overall fitness in general. 25 to 30 beats per minute drop in one minute is good. 50 to 60 is fantastic. HRV or heart rate variability. It's important to distinguish between acute HRV scores, daily scores, and longer term trends. For acute scores, a higher than normal HRV score at rest means you are either in good shape or it means high stress and or sickness. Yeah, again, it can be either good or bad. For acute scores, a lower than normal HRV score at rest means you are tired. For HRV, think normal equals good and ready to train. If we look at HRV trends over weeks or months, a modest increase in increasing HRV over time equals improved fitness. Conversely, a declining resting HRV over time equals declining fitness. Sleep quality. It's a good idea to track your quality of sleep somehow, as sleep is a good overall indicator of health and fitness. There are a lot of smartwatch sleep trackers on the market, so get one, use one, track your sleep. The last training concept is deep breathing exercises promotes recovery. While deep breathing has long been a part of meditation and yoga practices for years, it has only recently been spoken as an important component of both strength and endurance training. Slow breathing, sometimes referred to as deep breathing techniques, have been found to induce positive psychophysiological changes in brain-body interaction. Among the documented improvements are increasing HRV, threshold power, and overall mental health. The protocol for training concept seven is end every exercise session with deep breathing. Deep breathing is a great way to signal to your body that the hard work is over, that you are safe, that you can now focus on recovery. Aim for three to 10 minutes of deep breathing at the end of workouts. There are many variations to deep breathing out there, so use what you like. The two to one breathing is a common one-sided this is where your exhalation is twice as long as your inhalation. So that's my top seven training concepts and strategies I use when planning my workouts. I hope some of what I've covered is helpful to you. Finally, if you want this super brief Coles Notes version of training, take it from these folks that know a lot about training.
That's all I've got for today, folks. If you like this video, please give me a thumbs up and share it with your friends. If you're not a subscriber to this channel, please subscribe. It allows me to produce more content for all of you. Before I go, let me share this hilarious spoof on David Goggins with you. See you next time. Happy rolling. A lot of people ask me how I lost so much fucking weight. It's storming outside. I can hear the thunder. I, I didn't have no trainer. I didn't have no nutrition. Ah! Rachel Ray wasn't cooking meals for me. Right now, at this very second, all the bones in my feet are broken. My doctor told me, Goggins, you can't run so hard. Your liver's gonna give out. You don't know me, son! I told him, Doc, you a fat motherfucker. I stretch every day. Put your shit on, man. We're going for a run. A lot of people ask me, Goggins, do you use sunscreen when you run? I don't use none of these products and creams and shits. That's, that's poopy pants. You know what I hate? Poopy pants! Better not get all poopy pants on me right now. You're a cute little kid, man. But you're soft. You're fragile. A lot of alpha males are actually super fragile. Who's gonna carry the boats and the logs? I like nuts. I like to eat nuts because they give you some. Sometimes I like to fucking slap myself so I can suffer more. Who's gonna carry the boats? Use food as fuel. Am I overtraining? You gotta train before you overtrain. Take 10 seconds and get it again, beast. A lot of people ask me, do I wear headphones when I run? Shit, no. Energy. What are you gonna do when you ain't got no headphones? I couldn't pass any of my classes. You can't break boat crew too. And so I told myself, I'm a dumb motherfucker. Roger that. Read it again. A lot of people ask me, do I use my opposable thumbs? Nah, man, that's too easy. Stop getting poopy pants. Stay hard. Yeah. Flex.